All right, good afternoon all and welcome. We're excited to be here. We've got a great panel today and I know all of you are as excited as I am to hear from them. Give me about 60 seconds for some housekeeping announcements and then we'll get right down to it. First, we've applied for CLE credit in South Carolina, Texas, and Nebraska. In order for us to have a record for your attendance and to make sure you're paying attention the whole time, here's what we want, what we've got to ask you to do per the Commission on CLE. At the bottom of your screen in Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A button. If you can, at the beginning, right now, go ahead and, and, and put in a Q&A, I'll be the only one who can see it, with your name and your bar number. So for example, if it was me, I'd send a message that says, Miles Coleman, SC 078264. Uh, and if you can put the state uh, abbreviation, we'll know which state to send it to. I'll remind you again to do that in the middle of the program and then once again at the end. With that out of the way, uh, let's get right down to it. I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists in a minute, but, but let me start this way. I wanna kind of give the backdrop uh, sort of that, that I think will help set the tone. So about a year ago, uh, Generals Paxson and Peterson were in South Carolina. General Wilson was hosting them. Y'all were here for a Clemson versus Texas A&M football game, which uh, let the record reflect Clemson won 24 to 10. Uh, but so somehow y'all were in town and somehow I ended up at lunch with, with the three of y'all. It was like the three generals and I'm like a second lieutenant probably if we're going to carry that <laughs> out and a couple of my law partners. And I just remember sitting there uh, just sort of like listening to y'all, uh, you know, trading stories and talking about the initiatives and the projects you had underway and thinking to myself, man, I wish we could, we could share this with like a couple hundred of our closest friends. And, and that's what we're trying to do today. This webinar is, is an effort to kind of replicate that uh, informal collegial dialogue that, uh, that I, I found really so fascinating to hear from the three of y'all. Let me, let me do a couple of brief intros and then we'll, we'll, we'll start talking. I'll start, I'll take the moderator's privilege and introduce my own Attorney General first, Alan Wilson. Uh, earned his undergraduate degree from Francis Marion University, got his JD from the finest law school in the South, University of South Carolina School of Law, served as an assistant solicitor and assistant AG in private practice. He's an Eagle Scout, a National Guardsman, had a combat deployment in Iraq, was elected AG in 2010, and again in 2014, 2018. General Peterson earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Nebraska, his JD from Pepperdine, uh, served as a prosecutor and assistant AG and in private practice and was elected attorney general in 2014. General Paxton. Can, I, ask, can, I, can I include, I was kicked out of Cub Scouts. Alan <laughs> Eagles, I was literally kicked out of Cub Scouts. Okay, go ahead. So if there's any knot tying to be done today, we know we'll, uh, we'll send it to General Wilson. The Eagle Scout. That's right. General Paxton got an undergrad and an MBA from Baylor Law School at University of Virginia. Uh, was in private practice and in-house counsel, elected to the Texas House of Representatives from 2002 to 12, and then the Texas Senate from 2012 to 14, and in 2014 was elected AG, and still, I, I believe, has a senator in the House, uh, right? That's, yeah, my wife is the state senator for the same seat that I represented, doing a much better job than I did, and I made it to Weeblos. <laughs> Well, so, so, so that just says a lot about Ken that he'll actually marry a member of the Senate to get his budget beeped up in the General Assembly of Texas. I mean, that, 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 that's dedication right there to your office, man. But one of your yeah, people, we, were, in we were married like 30 years before that. So maybe I know, I but you put her, you put her in there in the Senate. You got to have a, someone on the inside. I think that's great. Well, it's no surprise that uh, it's a, this panel is hosted by the Federal Society. So we're going to talk some about federalism. And again, General Wilson, let me, let me send the first question to you and then uh, y'all can pass it around, jump in, uh, you know, piggyback off one another if you like. I wanna talk first about the role of a state attorney general uh, when it comes to maintaining what we might think of as vertical federalism, right? So the, the separation of powers that occurs between the federal government and the states. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk later about kind of the horizontal aspect of federalism between the states. Um, what what is I guess explain to us what is that role what what role do AGs play in maintaining that 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 balancing of power how has it changed over your years in office and how do you see it changing in the future? Well, Miles, first off, I'll I'll get to the question here in a few seconds, but I want to thank you again for facilitating this with FedSoc here in, in the chapter here in South Carolina. It's obviously, the three AGs on this uh, on this call right now are big supporters of that organization, and, and obviously. Uh, 
uh, really appreciate all that you guys do at the local and at the federal level in, in all of the chapters. And I want to welcome my two colleagues uh, to this local chapter event. And again, we've all, we, you'll see us joking with each other, picking on each other, but I, I can tell you that I've got great friends in both Doug Peterson and Kim Paxson. Um, it really has become kind of a, I guess I have to say fraternity. It used to be a fraternity, uh, but you know, we, we've added some, uh, some girls to the pack and so we're growing, but it's, it's just in a great, it's a great team of AGs to work with and I'm honored to serve with them. And we have some great national leaders throughout, this, throughout the United States in, in this particular office. Um, and of course, you know, when I, when I became attorney general in 2010, I think that was at that point in time, a little bit of historical context, since I'm, I'm technically the old guy, as, as Paxson likes to say, uh, not old in age, because I'm younger than both of them, but old in tenure. Um, that was when Obamacare was going on. And, and until Obama, until President Obama's administration had come to the fore, um, you know, AGs were off kind of on islands. You know, we, we would occasionally come together on this or that issue, but for law enforcement, cr criminal justice reform, you know, all these things going on. But it was the Obamacare lawsuit that really kind of created a synergy. And we quit being in our own fiefdom. So we all kind of came together, but basically become the, the national law firm for federalism. And it was really under the rubric of the Obamacare lawsuit that we really started to kind of gel uh, with each other about what is the appropriate role for the federal government as, as opposed to local governments. And you know, all, you know, you know that, that little overlooked amendment, you know, the 10th Amendment um, re really was something that came to the forefront you know, when I was first elected. And of course, it was during those first several years that the states really kind of rallied against each other um, to kind of say, hey, federal government, you, know, you have your role, we have our role, we need to respect those two those two lines. And, 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 a, and, a, and a metaphor that I used to use years ago, and I haven't used it in a long time, but for anyone on this Zoom call or this webinar who hasn't heard this before, I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick. I used to go to high schools and, and, and colleges and, and talk to groups, and I would say that the way I look at the role of the federal government is that there's an, there's an old 1950s movie, and these guys have heard me talk about this before, but it's a great metaphor. It's called The Blob, and The Blob is basically a cheesy B movie from the 50s where this alien pod lands in a field and a little blob rolls out and over the next hour and a half of the movie the blob is rolling along eating everybody and everything in its way i think james dean if i recall is the star of the movie for those of you over the age of 30 he was a big deal back then um but you know at the end of the movie the blob started where it started off as the size of a, a tennis ball is now the size of a house and you know the the, the pounds people learn in the army learns the only way to stop the blob is to freeze it and then, because you can't blow it up, you can't cut it up, you, you know, you, there's no other way to destroy it um, other than to freeze it. And then at the very end of the movie, they drop the blob in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and that is how they dealt with it. And of course, the movie ends with the end with a blobby question mark. And I tell people the federal government's a lot like the blob in that it rolls along. It's rolled along since, since the beginning of our nation. And as it rolls along at, with each passing generation, the role and scope of the federal government um, is, is like it has no limiting principles. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, consuming along the way, kind of like the blob. But instead of eating people, it, it eats your liberty. I mean, it, it, it occupies space. Um, power abhors a vacuum, and the government's no exception to that. And the government has just gotten so big and so huge and so invasive in every aspect of our life that there, are no, there is no longer a limiting principle into the size and scope of the federal government. And I don't know if this is directly to your point, Miles, but I guess I was trying to use a metaphor to draw basically the AGs, at least at least me, and I think I could speak for my friends here on, on, on camera, that we view our role as to keep the government, uh, and, and our, our tool bag is, is the court system, the rule of law is, is our weapons, to freeze the, to freeze the ever-expanding scope and size of the federal government. And oftentimes, that message gets maligned because just because when we say we're against the federal government doing something, there's an intent imputed to the AG that says you don't care about people. You don't want to help people with health insurance. No, that's not it at all. We just, you know, if a government can be all things to all people, a government big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take everything you have. And our role is to keep the government in check because the states is another component of our system of federalism. And we don't want the states to be um, basically dwarfed by the federal government, because one day the person who's voting for the big for the government to have the biggest gun, one day you're going to be in the minority party, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. And I don't want any party to to have a government so powerful that it crams down everything on everybody that is in the opposition party. And so that is why our role, like James Dean in the movie The Blob, is to freeze the scope and size and growth of government to keep it constitutionally constrained 
so that it doesn't become all encompassing. So that, that is kind of my philosophical view on the role of, as, as you said, vertical uh, federalism between us and the federal government. Let me, let, me, let me kind of ask a follow-up question to that, and I'm going to direct it to uh, General Peterson, if, uh, if, if that's right. So I, I think I'll say we, or at least I, often think of the, the, the role, the, the relationship between a state AG and the federal government, much in the way you've described, often being, if not adversarial, at least intention. Um, there are, I, I think that there, there are ways that they can, be, they can work in cooperation. And I know, uh, General Peterson, a, a, a big priority of your office uh, over the past several years has been combating human trafficking. And I, I, my understanding is that's an area where, where you and the feds have been able to work in great cooperation. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about that and about how, how the relationship there can be uh, a, a productive one when not an adversarial one. Yeah, sure, Miles. Um, for all of us as attorney generals, uh, our responsibility, our relationship with the U.S. Attorney's Office is important. Um, whether that we're dealing with officials in D.C. or whether we're dealing with our uh, state U.S. Attorney General. Um, in our case, uh, in the human trafficking area, they were very proactive. Uh, the problem we had in Nebraska is we didn't have a very compatible state law that was as strong in the area of human trafficking. And so we were able to get that passed. But I would say that relationship uh, has really strengthened in our state um, the enforcement of our human trafficking laws. So if you have the interstate activity, uh, we have the Omaha Human Trafficking Task Force that includes both local and uh, federal law enforcement officials. And then also when we look at enforcing our state law, we work uh, closely with Homeland Security when we could be looking at uh, possible labor trafficking. And in the sex trafficking, we're working primarily with the FBI. So those relationships are very important. Uh, I, a, another good example is that uh, meth is a serious issue in Nebraska. I got in touch with the, uh, the SAC here in Omaha and spoke with her about what we could do jointly in a federal state standpoint to address meth brought in the U.S. attorney as part of that. And so we've been working together to develop a, uh, basically a training program across the state of Nebraska to use both the federal resources and our state resources uh, to take on the math. And what's very helpful in that whole process is that the federal authorities have so much international and national material that are really important that a lot of our local law enforcement people wouldn't have access to. Uh, but working together in that area is going to, I think, really produce some good results in uh, basically trying to fight the meth problem that we have in the state. And, and, and let me explore too. There's uh, while we're sort of thinking in terms of vertical federalism, uh, we've been talking about it thus far in terms of the the, the division of power uh, between the federal government and the state. It can also, uh, to some extent. Uh, refer to the division of power between the state and then the the political subdivisions of the state. And uh, General Paxton, I'm going to let you talk about this, but before I do, uh, before I ask you the question, I'm going to I'm going to attempt. Um, this will be a triumph of man over machine if I can make it work. I'm going to read uh, a, a line, two sentences, from a letter that you wrote back in 2019 to the mayor and the city council of San Antonio, and then I want to share two tweets you sent that same day. This is the first line. Uh, verse two, you wrote, the Constitution's protection of religious liberty is somehow even better than Chick-fil-A's chicken. Unfortunately, I have serious concerns that both are under assault at the San Antonio airport. And then uh, follow that up with, uh, here's the part where I'm, I'm going to be technologically challenged. Let me see if I can, if I can make it work. You followed it up with uh, this tweet. Uh, and, and you've got the image there, and then a couple of days later, uh, with this one, let me, let me share one more, the uh, read more constitution. <laughs> <laughs> so so talk, talk, talk to us a little bit, hopefully everybody was able to see that, I think it worked. Talk to us a little bit about what, what was the fact pattern that led up to that, and what's the AG's role in sort of enforcing the constitution, not just up against the federal government, but down against 
political subdivision, cities and counties and the like. Well, thanks, Miles. And I appreciate you, you uh, moderating this. And I also want to thank the Federal Society for, for hosting this. And, and uh, Doug Peterson and I, before this started, we were really hoping that Alan Wilson would tell the blob story. And we're really <laughs> grateful for that. So thank you, Alan, for covering that one more time. Um, yeah, the Chick-fil-A was the, very interesting that the, the city council decided to kick Chick-fil-A out of their airport because supposedly they, they were not in line with some of the charities that they supported. Uh, they were helping organizations like FCA and Salvation Army, some of those horrible charities that we have, in, I think, all over the country. Um, and so we sent them a letter saying you can't discriminate based on you know, religious affiliation. And you got to see some of the, 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 the language of the letter and some of our tweets about what they were doing. It's actually still being investigated by the federal government and the FAA as to whether they could appropriately do that and, and still get uh, tax funded dollars. I think we may see a resolution of that actually pretty soon. But we've also found ourselves in Texas, you know, we as a state, you know, we know that the states created the federal government in, in Texas, the way our constitution is set up, the state actually created, creates the political subdivision so that the relationship, while it's important for many decisions to be made at the local level, at the city level, at the county level, for us, um, we at the state level have control over what the cities and, and, and counties do. And so the relationship is actually a little bit different. So we unfortunately had the opportunity to sue many of our cities over many different things that we see them uh, stepping into that they shouldn't step in much like the federal government does so cities like san antonio and austin we've had to sue over sick leave policies where they try to impose restrictions sick leave policies on businesses that are otherwise controlled by state state law and we've been successful in doing that we've seen lawsuits where we've had to we've had to sue the, you know, the local police department for, for violating state and federal immigration laws. We've also had to sue the city of Austin over violating property rights of people by imposing restrictions on their ability to rent their homes out to, to the people who would like to do a short-term rental or short-term lease. So the relationship is, is similar, but it's also very different in that we have the obligation and, and the responsibility of not only holding the federal government's feet to the fire and making sure that they follow the constitution, but also, as I just suggested and talked about, we've had to do that with a lot of local governments, and especially during this COVID crisis, whether it's related to releasing felons uh, inappropriately, which we all don't want, to um, dealing with mail-in ballots. It's, it's, a, it's a constant struggle to keep um, both federal and local governments in line with their constitutional role. Let me ask you this, and I'll also just direct this question to the panel. Uh, whoever whoever wants it uh, can can answer it. But it's it's related to the sort of the idea we've just been discussing, and and it, as y'all have already even mentioned, sort of the, the collaborative efforts uh, between uh, certain you know, state AGs. Uh, sometimes you'll hear folks refer to uh, state AGs offices as as a federalism law firm. Um, Talk, talk to us a little bit about how, how that works. Like, it, it, is, is there truth to that? What sort of collaborative action and efforts uh, do, do y'all and other state AGs undertake together? So, so why don't you let me start, start off by saying one of the reasons I was so interested in running for attorney general was really because of guys like Alan Wilson and Pam Bondi from Florida and Luther Strange from Alabama and Scott Pruitt from Oklahoma and Bill Sheedy from Michigan. I saw what they were doing to, to, to basically support the idea of federalism, that, that, that the federal government had certain responsibilities that were given to them by the states and by the Constitution, and that everything else remaining was with the states. And, and watching what these AGs did before me uh, was really what inspired me to go want to do this job and, and made me realize how important and how fundamental it was to not just my state as a state, but really to the survival of this beautiful work by our founders, the Constitution, and whether this idea of separation of powers was going to stand where there were three branches of government, there was the remaining power left to the states, and were we going to just let that go by the wayside as President Obama sought to push all the power to the executive branch. So um, I think that what I saw the AGs doing, what we've done, what we did, have done since then, I think we have been the, the law firm of federalism and the law firm that really has cared about 
whether this constitution, this experiment in, 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 in democracy was going to continue to be something that was part of our lives. Yeah, no, I was, I'll, I'll, go ahead, Doug. I'll, I'll, I'll I was going to say, Miles, I would, I would add to that. Um, I was in the Nebraska AG's office for three years in the late 80s, and there was really no activity going on at that time among uh, AGs that I'm aware of that was challenging uh, separation of power issues by the federal government. Uh, but once coming into office, uh, and as Ken said, AGs like Allen and some of the ones who were in office at the time, John Bruning, the former Nebraska AG, uh, were starting to become very engaged on some important issues. And one of the things that I think is so significant about our role as AGs is that if we see an abuse of separation of powers, whether they're sending out dear colleague letters or they're drafting uh, environmental regulations far beyond the scope of the original act, who steps in? You can have, for example, certain uh, organizations bring their lawsuits, but for the most part, the strongest party to come in and challenge the impact upon the states, the importance of maintaining the separation of powers, are the attorney generals. And uh, I think we've had some really significant victories when we saw the Obama administration uh, using regulatory authority outside their scope of power that influenced the states, I think, of uh, waters of the U.S. Um, the other uh, cases, certainly the DACA case was an issue where they were taking executive orders or going beyond the scope of the executive branch authority and creating additional adding to language in the enabling legislation. So these are all really important uh, issues to hold them to the constitutional standards. And I think that, but for the AGs in that arena, I'm not sure who would have been successful to challenge that. Now I'll, I'll echo what my colleagues just said. And I also want to, just a little point of personal privilege. I want to say that when, when Doug was in the AG's office in the late eighties, I was in junior high. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> let it see if it'll stick, but, uh, watching the blob instead of study. <laughs> uh, no, but no, seriously. Um, you know, like, like I said, when I came in, I kind of gave a little bit of a history of literally during the Obama administration, I think is when that, that dynamic in the paradigm shift occurred with how AGs, like I said before, we were law and order, law enforcement oriented, uh, you know, kind of off in our own corners, doing our own things. Occasionally we'd get together, talk about like general stuff uh, going on around the country. But it was during the Obama years, especially on the Republican side of the aisle, where you saw that explosion in the growth of government. And, you know, I think Obamacare would have been a, a, a cornerstone case that kind of gelled us. There, there was also the Clean Power Plan. There was the um, Dodd-Frank lawsuit. Um, just, just to name a couple of, of major lawsuits, uh, Doug referenced the waters of the U.S., the WOTUS rule, which was, you know, basically trying to take, uh, they were basically um, trying to make, I didn't call it the WOTUS rule, um, I, I called it, basically it was the, the lotus rule, the lands of the U.S., because it was converting what was otherwise ephemeral ditches into federal government regulated property, so you could regulate people's property out from under them, uh, at the federal level, you know, from some far di distant bureaucrat. So there were a lot of federal regulations and policies coming out. Most more recently, we've seen um, a, a local jurisdictions using local state nuisance law to dictate federal environmental policy. I'm sure that'll come up at some point on this panel. But I mean, you're, you're seeing uh, not, not just at the federal level, but you're seeing states, other states, left leaning states try to um, kind of, you know, grow the grow their role the role of government both at the federal level or beg borrow and steal what they can at the local level and, and do it there and, and again i want to give a shout out to ken uh his leadership on doc and the immigration issues that we you know and again no, no one's against uh immigrants you know that that was a narrative at the national level and you'll see in the media against republican ags but it was really about the rule of law and, and about you know you know drawing a line on the stand and say listen there's got to be a lawful way for people to come into this country but Again, all of this began in the last 10 years. I mean, everyone who's on this call right now watching this, I mean, you were alive either as lawyers or law students uh, when, when the, 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 there was a tectonic shift in how AGs around the country. And by the way, Dem Democrats, uh, all their, although in my opinion, they're using it for, for bad, but they're coalescing around the things that President Trump is trying to do. This never happened before the Obama administration. Well, that, that, that in some ways is a, is a perfect segue, right? One of the things, uh, General Wilson, you mentioned just a second ago was uh, that you're seeing or that, that you've observed uh, other states 
you didn't name any, but yeah, I'm sure we can all think of examples. Other states that are trying to kind of throw, you know, try, try to throw their weight around a little bit and, and, uh, and ex expand their power. Right, so that, that kind of takes us into more the topic of horizontal federalism, right? The way the power is distributed among the several states, to use the constitutional phrase. What's the, what's the role of AG, or, or maybe even give some, some examples, um, or I'm thinking, I'm thinking, for example, this was some years ago, but uh, Georgia and South Carolina uh, have, have jockeyed over water rights. Uh, I know that's, that's common out West, and, and there, there's other more ideological and less uh, perhaps practical things that states jockey over. What's the role of, of the AG in that sort of more of a horizontal uh, balancing and distribution of power among the states? You know, I could speak to that real briefly, Miles. We, um, when I took office, the prior Attorney General John Bruning had filed a lawsuit against uh, Colorado on their marijuana. They passed a constitutional amendment in 2012 for medical and then uh, 2014 for recreational. And we brought an original action in the U.S. Supreme Court based upon the constitutional provision that talks about original actions between states. Um, and frankly, by that time, Cynthia Kaufman was serving as Attorney General, so we had a very good you know, as far as the AG report, Cynthia was very good to work with. Um, what ended up happening is uh, they denied taking it as an original action. Uh, I think Justice Alito wrote a dissent saying, why shouldn't this be taken as an original action? Uh, it doesn't appear to be discretionary from the language of the Constitution, but the courts over a period of time have determined that it is a discretionary call by the court. The net effect of that was we got pushed into the Colorado state court action or federal court action and went to the 10th circuit and we're told we should file an original action. So a little bit frustrating. Um, but I would say what, what I'm seeing more often is not so much, it, it's pretty typical with the water law issues where you're gonna have um, state against state, they're gonna have a special master assigned and it is going to be an original action in uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. But uh, it, it's more common, and I think Waters of the U.S. is a good example right now. You know, that is still alive. California is now challenging the uh, Trump administration uh, regulation in that regard, what's referred to as the 2020 regulation. So they have filed and have, I believe, uh, 19 states in uh, California, and Georgia has let out 23 Republican states have intervened and challenged that action. So it's, it's getting a little bit more common to see states collectively uh, team up and be, uh, oftentimes based upon party affiliation to fight it because it's a really serious uh, dispute as to how the Constitution is viewed and, and, and what is the authority of the federal government. So Miles, I'd like to add to that. I, mine's going to be a little more interesting than Doug's. So I'll. Uh, <laughs> so we actually have, just as he said, we have a, a lawsuit against New Mexico over water issues. We also have a rule at original action at the U.S. Supreme Court against Delaware with 20 states where we filed because they are keeping monies from deceased people that had money orders, and they're requiring that the company that pushes those money orders out. Uh, have all the money go to them. So th that's an example. But we also have an interesting lawsuit against California. They, uh, they issued a travel ban for certain states. I know that my state fell on the travel ban. I think uh, Alan Wilson, yours did too. I'm not sure about Doug's. But the, the travel ban was uh, passed by the legislature in California, and it attacked the sovereignty of individual states like mine and Alan's that in, my, in our case, we had, we allow adoption by all types of different agencies, including religiously affiliated organizations that may or may not believe in same-sex marriage and may or may not place children with couples that are same-sex. And so because California found that uh, disheartening or discriminatory, they wanted to affect our state. So they, they passed the law empowering their attorney general to put a travel ban on all state employees going to states like Texas and South, South Carolina. We view that as completely unconstitutional and, and in violation of all kinds of principles set up by the, by the founders, which is you know, free exchange of people and, and commerce among states. And so we have another original action against uh, California uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court, and that is ongoing litigation that uh, we expect to ultimately win. 
And just to dovetail on, on what Ken was talking about, and this might migrate a little bit from the original question, but I think it's important. In South Carolina, it was a similar situation in which uh, yeah. our governor asked for a waiver from the Trump administration that would allow, we had a local, um, I don't know if it was a Catholic or Protestant uh, organization in the upstate that one of their one of their missions or one of their philanthropies and their, um, you know, one of their ways of doing service to their community was to follow, you know, to have an um, adoption agency, and they wanted to adopt children to families that shared their religious beliefs. And so um, oftentimes they would have somebody come who was not a Catholic, uh, I think it might have been a Jewish person, um, and I might be mangling the facts, it's been a couple of years, but, um, but they, you know, th their policy was is if you didn't comply with their religious affiliation, um, they would help you go to the state because, I mean, they didn't actually hold the children. The state held the children. They were just a facilitator. They would say, listen, we're not going to facilitate this adoption, but we will get you to someone who can facilitate an adoption for you. Of course, um, the, the state of California viewed that as also, they kind of tra transmuted or uh, extrapolated from that, you're against LGBT people, because if a gay couple wanted to come and, and, and adopt the child from this religiously affiliated adoption agency, um, then then that would be a, uh, you know, violating their rights to adopt the child. And of course, the rule basically just says that you can't force uh, an adoption agency to violate its religious beliefs, um, even when that, especially when that adoption agency was helping facilitate it. So they got a waiver from the federal government that allowed them to do this without violating federal regulation. And, uh, and of course, because of that, because that was seen as being anti-LGBTQ, uh, anti, you know, anybody that's not like you, um, that they put us on the naughty list, and which ban, when it says, when, when Ken says ban, it, they couldn't ban people from traveling here, they could ban state employees from coming here for like a conference or, or just spending some state dollars here, which, you know, we're fine, but, you know, but it was that, those kind of policies, and by the way, this is what I said to the AG of California, I said, if there was a, uh, a an agency that was looking for same-sex couples under that rubric that wanted to find children to adopt, I would have defended that under under the federal regulatory scheme. Um, for me, it, it's about uh, when, when you tell people that you have to comply with beliefs that you don't adhere to in order to be in the market of providing religious services, be it adoption or running a soup kitchen or whatever the case may be, or, or, or you know, abortifacient services. Some, some as we learned in the Hobby Lobby case, that private companies do, do have rights. But instead of a cram down, we want more people operating in that space, regardless of whether you're Jewish or Islam or Christian, whatever, you know, we want more people operating in that space. And I would have defended that, but we were placed in the naughty box, just like, you know, my, my colleagues here, because we didn't comply with California's values. And, you know, that, that, is, that, that is the kind of retaliatory things that are happening at the national level among our, our you know, brother and sister states. Miles, one other addition to that that's, um, I think, going to see some more litigation is you'll see states like California pass laws on how to raise livestock and to say that you have to, you know, a California viewpoint of how to raise a chicken is a little bit different than a Nebraska viewpoint of how to raise a chicken if you're in the business. And, but the problem is that they will, California has such a large market uh, that when they pass these uh, state laws, it has an impact on interstate commerce. And so we're seeing that. That's really for about the last three or four years been a, a challenge also. They're doing this with large automotive manufacturers with their emission standards, trying to impose uh, California emission standards on the whole country through policy because of their size. Obviously, they're trying to strong arm uh, auto manufacturers. Let me let me change change gears a little bit. Before I do, uh, reminder to our attendees: if you want CLE credit, we're slightly over halfway. So if you can send me another message in the Q and A with your name and your bar number, just so I can vouch for you to the commission on CLE that you're still here and still paying attention. Um, let me change topics a, a little bit. Yesterday, uh, President Trump released a new or an updated list with 20 new names on it for potential Supreme Court nominees. And you know, there's there's folks on there that, that uh, you know, Federal Court of Appeals judges, not surprising to see folks like that. But one thing I thought was interesting is you saw, you look at the list, you see a lot of AG fingerprints on it. There was one current AG, General Cameron from Kentucky. There's one former AG, uh, Josh Hawley, now in the Senate. Um, there's some former SGs, Lawrence Van Dyke, who's now in the Ninth Circuit, was SG of Nevada and Montana. Ted Cruz, former SG of Texas. There's a lot of AG connections on there. Clearly, 
somebody or some group of bodies think that being an AG or working a high level in an AG's office uh, prepares you uh, or, or is a good, a good training ground for dealing with significant issues, a broad range of issues at a high level. Talk, talk, talk to us a little bit about, um, maybe, that, maybe this is the choir preaching, you preach to the choir, the choir preaching to the preachers, but to, to talk, talk to us a little bit about, about that, the fact that there's so many AG-centric folks on that list. What is it about the office that, uh, that you think especially prepares somebody for that kind of a, a broad ranging role? Well, I'll just say, first of all, Miles, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that the list didn't include Helen Wilson, Doug Peterson, and myself. I'm, I'm sure that that's an oversight that will be corrected down the road. But no, I'm not surprised at all with the issues that we deal with. And, and even beyond the ones you mentioned, Jim Ho, who's on the Fifth Circuit, was also mentioned. He came out of our office. And I think the last five or six Fifth Circuit judges, many district court judges have come out of our office. I think the types of issues we deal with and the experience that you get um, not only provides sort of insight into the legal issues, but just how you think and how you'll approach legal issues in the future. And it happens for a lot of these people at a relatively young age. So they're, they're prime candidates with their experience and, and, and their opportunity to showcase their talents. Uh, they're prime candidates for, for Supreme Court judicial positions and other judicial positions, as well as some significant roles in the private sector. Yeah, I, I think the nature of the office provides it all because you have a, a, a large criminal appeal section and criminal prosecution in most AG's offices. You have a lot of civil litigation. Um, you cover so many different topics um, that it really does give you a great, I can't think of a better uh, place to really cut your teeth in understanding the law and being prepared, particularly on the federal bench. Um, I think the only thing you don't do is estate planning. Can, didn't you do estate planning? I've done it, yeah, I've done it all. <laughs> But other than that, uh, it's, it's such a great learning ground uh, for a lawyer to go from this experience to the bench. In fact, I just had one of our important lawyers tell me that uh, he's going to throw his hat in, and I hate to lose him, but he'd be a very good judge. And, you know, the, the Attorney General's office is the perfect juncture of politics, policy, and law. And I think people who go through an AG's office that have that background, who've litigated at the state and the federal level, and a lot of these people that have come through our offices have come from the federal system, maybe as a law clerk at the Supreme Court or Court of Appeals in that jurisdiction or, or elsewhere. Um, but like I said, understanding the, you know, the, the, the policy and the law is vital, but also, and, you know, judges are supposed to be apolitical, but I think understanding you know, the political landscape is also important um, when you're a judge. And I think people who um, have gone out there and been on the battlefield fighting, you know, at the last redoubt of the attorney general's offices, um, you know, on, on a lot of these issues, I mean, it's, it's a cornucopia of issues. It's a buffet. I mean, we've talked about environmental law, public nuisance law, you know, federalism, individual rights, liberties, religious liberty. I mean, I mean, the second amendment, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And so you touch almost every facet of life when you're in an AG's office. And I think it's a great uh, training ground for, for future judges and future AGs and, and future legislative leaders. Let me, let me follow up on that. You mentioned the Second Amendment. Um, Carol, listen, you re very recently filed a state court lawsuit against our fair city, famously hot Columbia, South Carolina, uh, regarding some, some gun laws there. How, how, like, how common is that? How often do AGs go around trying to enforce the Second Amendment? Well, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I've tried to stay out of, I'm a person who believes that government at the local level should have more influence in a person's life than government at the state level or government at the federal level. I think government, uh, you know, power should be closest to the people. And so generally in our state, we have what's called home rule. Um, I'm a big believer in home rule that local councils and city councils and town councils should have the most say under the rubric of home rule law. And it's also enshrined in our state constitution. And so all of those things should be pushed down at the local level as much as possible. And I'm often asked to get involved in local disputes, um, you know, the mask ordinances and things like that. Um, they're very controversial. And a lot of my freedom loving, you know, friends around the state of South Carolina who are hardcore conservatives, you know, they, want, they, they wanted the state to get more involved on the mask ordinances. But, you know, for me is, is that generally speaking, local government, the general rule, the general rule is local government runs the show at the local level with exceptions. And those exceptions are obviously the state and federal constitution or state and federal law through preemption. 
in South Carolina, and, I, and I've said this, I, I, when I called the mayor to let him know about the lawsuit coming, there have been a number of um, city ordinances passed over the last two years involving the regulation and governance of how guns can be held, carried, manufactured, um, possessed, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say. And there's a specific state statute that says that the General Assembly has basically carved out for itself all matters involving the manufacture, sale, distribution, possession, and ownership of firearms. It's kind of all encompassing. And the reason our General Assembly did that, and, and I even had Democrats, you know, friends of mine in the General Assembly, who are pretty hardcore left on a lot of issues, who said, you're right on this. We, we want this issue because we don't want a patchwork of gun laws around the state. You know, I drive through four jurisdictions. I live 20 miles from here, drive through four separate jurisdictions just to get to my office in downtown Columbia. And can you imagine if every single jurisdiction in the state started having its own ordinance on how you can carry a firearm, possess or own a firearm uh, because of the values of that specific city or town council? And so the General Assembly said, listen, we're going to have gun policy debated at a state level. Uh, and we're going to have that, you know, every, every city and county has elected state representatives and state senators who can represent the values and beliefs of what, how that gun should be governed at the state level. And so I, I brought a, a lawsuit because the city of Columbia had brought not one, but I think four separate ordinances over a period of a year. And we, we, had, we had opine, given legal opinions, as to the legality or lack thereof of the city to do that. But we never, we never intervened. And in December of last year, I sent a letter to the city and to the mayor saying, you guys are coloring outside the lines. And, you know, and I would ask that you not, and I knew what the answer would be, but I wanted to give peace a chance. And so I said, listen, we, we're going to have to intervene at some point if you don't. But if you, if you want these ordinances passed, you need to run it through the General Assembly. And I, you know, as a matter of philosophical belief, I thought some of the ordinances were unnecessary, uh, don't really address anything. Um, I think they're feel-good values, you know, kind of virtue signaling. But be that as it may, that could be handled at the state legislative level. Um, so they, they basically told me what I could go do with myself, which they had a right to do. So we brought a lawsuit, and of course that happened right before the pandemic. It is slowly weaving its way through that. We, we appealed to the state Supreme Court. State Supreme Court says, we're not going to hear this petition, Let's go back through the court system. So right now we've got all our briefings before the, the circuit court here in Richland County, and we expect that this thing will slowly grind its way back up to the Supreme Court. But at the end of the day, under the, under the you know, I want to end with this. The Second Amendment is, is really at the principal cornerstone of this case because if local governments can have a patchwork of different policies, that makes it almost impossible for people to carry a firearm through multiple jurisdictions as we travel every day. And that undercuts uh, the Second Amendment. And secondly, there's a preemption issue at play here at the state level from state law that basically um, has taken from local home rule that, that exception. It has exempted from home rule the ability to regulate the possession and ownership of guns. So that is why I brought the lawsuit. Um, and obviously we're gonna hold to our guns and we'll take it to the top if we have to, but that's why we brought the suit and that's where it is right now. General Pax, let me, let me send the next question to you. Um, probably about a month ago, uh, the South Carolina chapters hosted a Zoom webinar, very similar to this one, uh, but with a number of state solicitors general. Um, and all of them uh, sort of admitted, grudgingly perhaps, but admitted that the Texas SG's office sets the bar. Uh, and I will point out, this included one of your neighboring rival states who, who shall remain unnamed. And it was grudging, they all admitted, nah, Texas, Texas sets, the, sets the bar. Let me ask you, in, in terms of a both substantive role and in terms of what we might think of as you know, personnel as policy, right? You look at the, the stream of Texas SGs from Senator Ted Cruz, you know, going on up the line. Um, how, how has that role changed? Uh, how is it, how do you use it? Uh, and how do you, how do you foresee it uh, changing or modifying or being useful in the future? Miles, first of all, thanks for having me on. I actually have to leave in about five minutes because we're doing a press conference uh, with the governor related to our, our police force in Austin, and we have all kinds of issues going on with that. So, uh, so I just wanted to preface my question by letting you know I have to step away for that press conference. But, you know, I think there's just been a lot of effort in Texas for years, even before I got here, to build up a Solicitor General's office that would be um, talented 
and have the ability really to take on the federal government. We, we're a large state, we're a large Republican state, and we have resources that a lot of other states don't have. And it's just because we're large and, and we've been relatively prosperous uh, through you know, the last several decades. And so we've tried to take advantage of that. And we've always wanted to be in a position where we could go toe to toe with, with any DOJ, Republican, Democrat, and, and take a, make it a fair fight. And, and sometimes maybe have an advantage by having the talent that can go in front of the US Supreme Court or the Texas Supreme Court or the Fifth Circuit or whatever trial court and and uh, and offer up you know the best arguments for constitutional government and for honoring the Constitution and for our, our, our freedoms that we so much care about so when I came into office you know we we already had a really good Solicitor General's office as, as you know Ted Cruz was Solicitor General we had a lot of other talented previous SGs including Jim Ho who's on the Fifth Circuit and we've continued that tradition and I think it's it's served us well and the people that come in have you know, amazing opportunities after they leave, either in the private sector or in, in the judiciary. So we're proud of that. We've also tried to bolster our trial court uh, team. For, we have a special litigation team that I wanted to bolster when I got here, and I feel like we've also been really good at improving the talent there so that we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe from, you know, the first document filed till all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and and offer up to anybody a challenge and, and, and the opportunity to... to to provide great arguments and, and defend the Constitution. Well, and, and let me say, I, I'm not sure exactly when you've got to drop off, but if it's abruptly, thank you for joining us. Stick around as long as you can. We understand that uh, that, that duty calls, uh, but, uh, but but thanks for being willing to join us today. And thank um, you. Let me, let me address this to the, to the panel. Um, one of the things that, that got mentioned a little bit ago, I think uh, first General Peterson by you and then uh, General Wilson, you followed up on it as well, was how it, it was in the context, I think, of California, whether it had to do with uh, emissions, automotive emission standards or agricultural husbandry, that sort of thing. Now, one state can have an, an effect in that case due to their their economic weight can have an effect beyond their borders. Let me rephrase the question or reframe the issue a little bit differently and ask you what you think about that. So in other contexts, uh, AGs have by some been accused of what's sometimes called regulation by litigation. Um, AG brings a lawsuit against you know, some large corporation, some you know, big target, and it ends up either in a consent decree, uh, a consent order, a settlement of some sort, it includes often oversight, monitoring, or requirements that maybe surpass or go beyond what the whether it's you know the state or federal regulatory agency has put in place. Some folks, you know, some commentators, uh, authors have pointed to that and saying, "Look, you're trying to have an outsized one. You're trying to have a have a have a uh, effect outside of your geographic jurisdiction, and two, you're trying to impose regulations." that should have been imposed uh, by an agency. What, um, I, I guess, what's the, what's the response to that, to the folks who have, who have raised that argument or who see that as sort of almost a separation of powers problem? I think it's a real problem, Miles. Uh, you see it particularly in the environmental area where a friendly um, environmental organization will take the lawsuit uh, to a friendly um, state and a friendly, friendly district court reach terms of settlement, uh, which in effect create uh, regulation and get it approved by the court, and then act as if that is now the new guideline. And I think the only way you can address that is, frankly, from the state perspective, saying that the, the ruling of the Northern District of California does not have authority over the state of Nebraska as we address a similar environmental issue. I think it has to be challenged, though, because I think it's really a deceitful practice that takes advantage of um, the courts. It's basically creating uh, authority in the court that belongs in the legislative branch or the executive branch in carrying out, for example, environmental policy. And um, it's, it's one that I think has to be called out every time it's done uh, to expose the, the practice and challenge the practice. It, it, yeah, I agree with what Doug said. Uh, you know, I saw this a lot during the Obama years um, where it, it wasn't just a friendly state. It was a friendly agency like the EPA uh, back in the day. Um, and of course, you know, uh, 
a, a blue state would sue the EPA on some regulation and they'd be like, oh, let's, let's go ahead and enter a consent decree and there you have regulation through litigation. And it was, it was, I mean, it was blatant in, in what they did. Um, and you know, Doug and I have been in a lot of lawsuits. You know, um, you know, our, our view is, is that, um, you know, that, that regulations need to go through the APA process. They need to go through the appropriate federal, you know, legal processes that are laid out, that rubric that's laid out before it. And a lot of times, you know, remember back in the day, the phone and the pen comment. And, and by the way, I mean, I'm, if I'm being intellectually consistent, I mean, there have been times in the last three, you know, I've been the big supporter of the president, but there have been times you know, where I felt like uh, the phone and pen thing was the last president, and I kind of felt like it was happening in this administration. And, and again, I think that's large in part because, you know, Article 2 of our Constitution is a lot shorter than Article 1 of our Constitution because I don't think the founders ever envisioned the executive branch led by the president being as big and monstrous as it is. And what's happened over the years is that Congress has just passed larger and larger and larger bills, which give general guidelines, and then they, the guidelines basically are intended to give very generalized regulatory authority to the executive branch agencies that the president appoints. And it's gotten to the point now where we're, 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 we're basically uh, governing through a uh, regulatory fiat. Uh, so, you know, you have a law passed way over here, whether it's under, you know, title seven or, or, or some of the EPA, regular uh, EPA law, federal um, NEPA law or whatever. And then all of a sudden through, thousands and thousands of pages of regulations is being enforced by an unelected bureaucrat and it's so far from the original intent of the federal law that, um, that you know, we're being governed now by people who have never been confirmed by the Senate or appointed by the president or elected by anybody. And so we, we become a regulatory state, an administrative state. And, and that is something that I have really been against since the beginning of my tenure as attorney general. And so I've always believed that our role is to try to roll back that regulatory power structure and, uh, you know, and so the other side has really been good and effective at having friendly lawsuits, uh, regulation through litigation. And my goal is to is to use litigation to roll back regulation, if, if, if at all possible. We've got we've got about seven minutes or so left. Let me let me again change gears just a little bit. Um, I, th I think it would be it's, it's possible. I think it's even likely that a lot of folks both on this call uh, folks who are in the AG's office that work under you, folks in your state, might look at, at the two of y'all, at, at General Paxton, who had to drop off a minute ago, and they might think, those guys are just batting a thousand. I mean, elected to statewide office, they're shutting down human trafficking organizations. Uh, General Wilson, you just brought home, well, I think, of, what, a $600 million plutonium settlement. I think, man, every time that guy steps up to the plate, he hits a home run. So excuse, excuse me for asking, I'm going I'm to ask a compound question, which I know I shouldn't do, but number one, like, is that really true? Like, do, it, is that true? And then number two, if it's not, what's an example of a challenge or an obstacle or something you've had to overcome uh, and learn from to get to where you are today? Well, I'll, I'll just say kind of off the cuff, it feels like I get hit by errant pitches more than I hit pitches. <laughs> 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 Getting hit in the head every other pitch. Um, that's what it feels like. No, I mean, I thank you for saying it. I, you know, we don't bat a thousand. I mean, listen, I, I we lose a lot of cases, and you know, we we make mistakes along the way, or, or you know, I mean, we're all human, and we do our best to do what we can. Um, but you know, we like I'm really proud of a lot of the work that we've done. You know, um, you know, the growth of the Human Trafficking Task Force in the state, um, the growth of our Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. I mean, we're in every single county and municipality in the state of South Carolina. We had, we started with 15 members of our Human Trafficking Task Force. We're now over 400. Uh, we got, um, you know, uh, domestic abuse, uh, domestic violence awareness month coming up. And, you know, we've just grown in leaps and bounds in those areas. And there's so many things that we are just really exploding at, you know, um, oftentimes I feel like my failures are more pronounced in the media than my successes, um, you know, just because that's, that's how it feels when you're in elected office. But, um, you know, listen, I have a great staff and a great team and we have a lot of legislative priorities and, you know, over the years, um, you know, I've, I've really struggled with explaining the role of the office to people, um, even especially people on my side of the aisle with my political views of the world. Um, you know, the, it's not the attorney general's job to effectuate your conservative agenda. It's the attorney general's job to enforce the rule of law. And sometimes there are laws out there that people, that, that, that aren't good laws, but they're not unconstitutional. They're just not good laws by policy. And so sometimes I have to step up and say it's a constitutional law. And then people say, you're for that law. Like, no, I didn't say I was for that law. So, I'll, you know, one of the one of the struggles I've had as attorney general 
uh, you know, I think in your list of questions, like do overs, is the number of times that I have not messaged uh, the role of this office effectively to the general public. Um, you know, the general public, you know, er everyone second guesses and triple and quadruple guesses every single thing that you do as attorney general after you have done it. And, you know, for people to be able to do that, you got to recognize there has to be a first guesser before there can be a second guesser. And usually when I'm guessing the first time, I'm guessing with a team of attorneys who are not looking at this through some political lens, but looking at it through a rule of law lens. And so, you know, for me, that has been a struggle is just explaining to the public, both on the conservative side of the aisle and the more liberal side of the aisle, what is the appropriate role of the office? And, you know, sometimes that message doesn't cut through all the clutter and clatter and the media that they put out. There's a lot of smoke out there. And so, you know, it's, it's just messaging. And that's been an ongoing struggle for me. You know, what I would say, Miles, is it, uh, I had a litigation practice for about 28 years. Um, and this is, this job is, from a lawyer's perspective, it's one of the most gratifying jobs I can imagine that you have. Because when you come in each day, you can move the needle. You can start initiatives on things that matter. Uh, I've really enjoyed, really enjoyed the relationships with people like Alan and Ken. Uh, the camaraderie we have and working together on some stuff and, and the professionalism. Uh, you know, I probably came in a little bit jaundiced thinking there might be uh, a lot of politics involved. But uh, when Alan talks about the rule of law, he really means it matters to him. And it's great to work with these types of guys uh, in roles that, frankly, I didn't perceive how much we'd be fighting against an aggressive uh, uh, federal uh, movement and I'm, I'm gratified in that. I would say the biggest uh, lesson I've learned is the importance of messaging because a lot of things are difficult to message in such one if you have a media that doesn't fully appreciate the rationale. Um, DACA is a good example. DACA was an example of a president using uh, trying to expand the definition of a law. Well, you may be okay if you like the president who's in office at the time, but how do you feel when it's someone else who's expanding the definition of law? So that was one that was important that we tried to explain the importance of uh, the uh, keeping each branch of government within their boundaries. And it was, it was just too hard to overcome the emotional side of that. And uh, sometimes you just never can get over that challenge. But messaging is important and it's very difficult to do in an eight second soundbite. But the, the rewards of the job, working with really professional lawyers. Uh, today was a good example. I come in this morning, kind of an emergency issue, hits the fan. I pull together our four people that I want to evaluate it. Just great legal minds, and uh, it really is a pleasure to work with people like that and to be able to do things that really better this state. And uh, also uphold the Constitution, so it's, it's very rewarding. Miles, can I add one thing? It says 259. I know you got to wrap up at the hour. If I could just take 30 seconds. Yeah, you know, I'm really concerned about the narrative going on around the country. Uh, you know, when you look at all the civil unrest in some of the far out West cities and, you know, New York, Illinois and other cities, you, a, a lot of the, the stuff unfolding with Black Lives Matter. And you see a lot of the, this narrative about the cops and things. And I'm, I'm really concerned about this narrative and where it's going, especially the defund the police movement. It doesn't feel like it's real because it's not really in our backyard. But everything that um, starts out there eventually ends here. And I'm very concerned about it. And one of the things on messaging that I encourage people to do you know, this morning, I'm not going to say where or what because I didn't promote it. But I've, I've been I was invited by a black pastor to go to his church for a food drive today. And I just drove over there and rolled up my sleeves and started um, helping them hand out food to needy families and people who were there to uh, the food drive. And I, I don't want credit for that in the media or anything. I didn't put anything on social media, but the whole point is, is that I think we need to start going to communities that don't really view us as friendly to them, but to, just, just to be in their community and to listen to them and support them without any, without any reason to receive anything in return, because at some point we're going to have to hit a lot of this civil unrest head on and the defund the police movement. And it's really going to, it's going to impact desperately speaking black communities and my other minority communities if we don't get in front of this right now from a crime standpoint. So going out there in the communities and being part of them is something that we as AGs need to be doing. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I did that this morning. Well, let me just to wrap up, take uh, two points of personal privilege if I can. First, we're at the end of the program. And so we need for those seeking CLE credit, your final check-in in, in the Q&A. And then secondly, if you're in the Columbia, South Carolina area, 
And if you'd like a free lunch, socially distanced, uh, safe and sanitized, you can come to my office, Nelson Mullins, 17th floor on Monday at noon. Ilya Shapiro from Cato Institute will be doing a, a preview of the upcoming Supreme Court term. Um, we'll have, uh, we'll, he'll have book plates of his forthcoming book to sign. We'll have a free book to give away and uh, lunch from DePrados. I mean, who can say no to that? Um, with that, I do want to be respectful of our speakers' times. Generals Peterson and Wilson, thank you so much. Uh, I, know, I know everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did, and we appreciate your time so much and your service uh, to your respective states. So thank you. Thank you, Miles. Take care, Alan. You too, Doug. See you soon, buddy.